Professeur Massé, bienvenue dans notre, dans notre commission. Alors vous, vous êtes professeur et directeur adjoint pour la cybersécurité de l'Université du Colorado. Et donc vous êtes un peu notre expert invité et je vais vous donner la parole pour dix minutes justement concernant ces questions. En tout cas, bienvenue dans notre commission et la parole est à vous. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this. So, uh, as was mentioned, I'm currently at the University of Colorado. Uh, prior to that, I ran uh, vehicle cybersecurity for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So, uh, next slide, please. As already has been mentioned here, uh, what we're going to talk about is the connected vehicle and, and how we access the connected data and the security of that data. Uh, as, as the group has already acknowledged, uh, there is a revolution taking place in terms of vehicles. Uh, if we look simply at the amount of software on a vehicle, the, the top line up there is the, amount, the number of lines of code in a typical vehicle. And this is a vehicle you would go buy on the dealership right now. Uh, over 100 million lines of code in a typical car. To put that number in comparison, that's twice the number of lines of code in Facebook and orders of magnitude, more than 100 times the amount of code in something like a space shuttle. So the vehicle is already here. It's already connected. The revolution that's already been mentioned by, by several of the speakers is occurring and, and is only accelerating. So next slide, please. Uh, so for the connected and autonomous vehicle, we have a, a ton of interesting data coming off that. Uh, it's, a, it's already out in the community. They're already serving as sensors. They're already connecting to what we're, we're seeing as these emerging smart communities. Of course, the vehicle is providing the data related directly to automotive functions, such as the gas mileage, the emissions, uh, the engine performance, that sort of thing. That's, that's been there. That's accelerating. In addition to the typical automotive data, there's geographic data. Where is the vehicle located? Where has it been driven? Uh, you know, is it, how is it finding parking spaces? How is it commuting to and from, from work and, and that sort of stuff? That data is available now as well. Uh, environmental data that tracks everything from the emissions the vehicle is putting out to the current temperature. You can get amazing maps of weather off, off vehicle data. Your vehicle has sensors in it that record what the current temperature is. It has sensors that keep track of, with the windshield wipers, how hard, it, how hard it's raining. And so all that data is there, as well as many, many new uses of data. We've, it's already been mentioned that the vehicle is talking to the smart grid. The vehicle is talking to, to many places. And we don't know exactly what all those uses are going to be. And we found that, especially myself coming from the academic side, we've been very bad at predicting where innovation will occur. Right? If you look back at some of the classic quotes, you know, people have said you know, things like these, the, the mobile phones, which we all have, you know, they're not going to get any market share. Uh, clearly, that, that did not pan out. We've had folks as brilliant as, as Albert Einstein saying something like, nuclear power will never be possible, right? We've always got the technical piece wrong. So what we'd like to do is not say we know what the future will bring. We know there's a revolution going on, but we don't know where that revolution is going to take us. The best we can do is help enable innovation. So next slide, please. All right. So, so how do we enable innovation? Well, I, one of the things we have to do is we have to assume that we don't know how the data will be used, and we have to open up the market so that that next generation, some of the students sitting in the back and uh, you know, some of the other folks, they might have the next revolution on how vehicle data is going to be used. We want to make sure that they have access to the data, that their innovative ideas can come to the forefront and can compete. Uh, by doing that, we're actually benefiting the incumbent players. We're benefiting the, the the large industrial corporations who already are leaders in this field and bringing more, more energy, more diversity, more unique directions only benefits those players. So what ideally we'd like to do is have a level playing field that allows everyone from the large automaker to the, to the new innovator to come in and say, how are we going to use this data in unique and creative ways? The way we do that is the way, the way I believe we need to do that is with open standards. Right, so the open standards allow, uh, you know, allow anyone to come in. They don't predict exactly how the data will be used. Instead, they say, ah, let's create the framework on which the innovators can build. Right? The, key access, the key idea there is to allow access to innovation. Uh, we want to provide common communication protocols. As, as this group already knows, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication is, is becoming more and more standard. So that's V-to-V. 
vehicle to infrastructure communication where your vehicle is talking to the, the street light, talking to the parking space, talking to other parts of the infrastructure, that V to I communication is coming as well and is, is largely in place. Uh, in addition to that, the vehicle communicating with your smartphone, with your with your home automation system, with all sorts of devices, many devices we don't we haven't even envisioned yet, that vehicle to everything, V to X communication is happening too. So if we can build a system that allows innovation, that same innovation is going to help us innovate on the security space as well. I want to spend my remaining time talking about the security of the data, so let's move on to the next slide. All right. So you know, again, th this should be somewhat obvious already for the Commission, and the European Union has really led the way in many respects in this direction. Right? We've already passed the point where there is cyber in all of our vehicles. Uh, we've also passed the point where there have been demonstrated attacks on vehicles I in a research setting. At some of the major cybersecurity conferences, people have demonstrated ways that they can, they can actually take control of a vehicle remotely and so those cyber events, they already have been shown in the labs. What we haven't seen yet is any large-scale attack where vehicles have, cyber attacks on vehicles have caused problems, and hopefully we'll never, we'll never get to that point, right? So what we want to do is build the structure that prevents that before, before an incident occurs. But time is short because there's already been demonstrations of cybersecurity issues you can do in the vehicles. The connected vehicles are only in increasing the amount of data they exchange, how we exchange the data, what we do with the data. So we need to act now. And it's, it's great to see, to see the EU and, and, and reports such as Gear 2030 coming out and really addressing this problem now rather than waiting to, to try to do it later. So next slide, please. So as a professor, I'm going to bore you with just one slide on there are fundamental concepts in cybersecurity. I'm not going to talk about all these. This is a slide that, that comes from one of the standard textbooks in cybersecurity. This would be slide two in my, my undergraduate lecture on cybersecurity. There are many core concepts in cybersecurity. When we talk about how are we going to secure the data for the vehicles, we don't need to start from scratch. We just need to start from the principles that have already been around for decades, and I'm going to zero in on two of them, uh, open design and separation of privilege. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about what those both are. So next slide, please. So, so open design has long been recognized as one of the critical features in cybersecurity. The reason we do open design is because we're competing against an adversary, right? There's someone who's trying to, to do something bad to our vehicles. And it's difficult to predict what the adversary is going to do. If I'm the designer of the system, I'm the least capable of seeing the unique ways to attack the system. I've built the system. I think this is how the system is going to work. I will design my defenses based on how I think the bad guy will, will come in and try to get us. But, but the adversary almost certainly will think differently, right? And that's one of the fundamental problems of allowing the system designer to also be the primary security analyst or the security designer. The adversary will think differently. As a great analogy, if anyone's played on any competitive sports, any time you compete against another team, you come in with an expectation of what plays they will run. Uh, but anybody who's also played, it's rarely been the case. For me, it's never been the case that the opposing team did exactly the plays I expected they would do. Right? The opposing team always did something slightly different, and I needed to adapt. So we need to have a system with an open design that brings in those other ways of thinking that isn't just the system designer saying, ah, this is what the adversary would do. Instead, it opens up the view to the wider audience. And that benefits from the expert views, you know, folks like, you know, presumably like myself, but also from people who are going to think very differently from me and come in and say, ah, but I would attack the vehicle in this way. And it's something that I probably won't think of and the designers won't think of as well. So we want to have that open system. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to the open design, it's very critical to have this idea of separation of privilege and, and keeping the overall system so that everyone can understand and everyone can assess it. So there's a, a common refrain in security to say security through obscurity is not really security. So security that says only the system designer or only the security designer knows how the system will work that's fundamentally flawed because what will happen is only the system designer and the adversary will learn how the system will work. The consumer, the fleet manager, the government agency trying to run the vehicle, 
the obscurity will keep them from understanding how the vehicle works, but it won't keep the bad guy from understanding how the vehicle security works. So we want to make that design, again, open. We want to give folks access. Uh, we also want to never assume that there's a secure perimeter. This is a classic mistake in cybersecurity to say, ah, I will always keep the bad, bad guy out of my vehicle or out of my network or out of my company. As, as multiple news stories have demonstrated, that never works. What you need instead is this idea of separation of privilege, where I expect that there may be some penetrations into aspects of the vehicle, but I will work to keep things such as, you know, playing the music from my cell phone separate from, say, the anti-lock brakes control. Uh, and if I can build in that separation of, of privilege, that separation of mechanism, that's a key to cybersecurity. So if I can do that, if I can build the open design and plan for that separation of privilege, never coming in and saying, I will build a perfectly secure communication system that will prevent anyone from getting to the vehicle. That will not occur. Anyone who says, I've built the perfect cybersecurity system, they are simply wrong. Right? There, is, there is no perfect cybersecurity system. There are only levels of risk, levels of adversaries, and an understanding of where we are on the, that scale of risk. So what we want is what we call defense in depth, an open design with defense in depth so that it's harder to get. It may be possible to change the radio station in my car, but it's much harder to control the anti-lock brakes. So next slide, and this is my last slide, and then I would love to have any questions or discussion. So some recommendations going forward from a cybersecurity standpoint. If you can have an open design, that's going to both promote innovation and promote cybersecurity. Uh, it allows everyone to look at it. If we can have these policy frameworks that embrace the open systems, that encourage that encourages the innovation, it encourages the security, the more open it can be, the better it can be, and we won't be in the position of saying, ah, I'm going to predict where the automotive industry will be in five or ten years. I think that prediction, uh, at least certainly for myself, any prediction I make is almost certainly going to be wrong in ten years, and you can simply look at at the history of technological pr you know, predictions to say how laughable some of those have been. So instead of saying, I know where it will be in 10 years, I instead build in this open design that enables innovation. I do defense in depth through separation of privilege. And, and I think that's, that's part of what the recommendations are, are leaning toward. And I, 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 applaud, uh, you know, I applaud the work that's going on bringing this to the forefront because this is data that is being developed now. And it's it's coming out at this point. So uh, thank you for the thank you for the opportunity to talk about this, and uh, and thank you for for pushing the security of the connected vehicle forward.